at a funeral home and I help people who are alive plan their own funerals. And then also uh, later on, after they've died, I will maybe officiate at that funeral. Oh, they say. See, I'm the guy that people avoid at parties. Although I will say that this job that I have has taught me more than anything else I have ever done. My life has changed so fundamentally by talking to people on a regular basis who are 20, 30, 40 years older than me, and the things that I learn from them are invaluable. And I thought maybe you'd like to uh, hear some of those stories, and maybe they will affect your life as well. And that's why the topic of my uh, uh, conversation today is the power of dreams and memories. Let us first talk about memories. I think stories do the best job of instructing. And this story is called The Two Delusional Ladies. I met the first lady on Monday. And part of my job, she wanted to plan her own funeral, is to find out about her life. And she started describing it the following way. It was wonderful. I grew up in the prairies of South Dakota on a small farm, and I'd watch the sun rise every day, and the beautiful, crisp air, and I'd help my mom gather eggs from the chicken coop, and I'd help my dad with the chores, and then we'd walk five miles to school, and we'd pick wildflowers. It was delightful. My granddaughter says, oh, Grandmama, I wish that I could be a little girl with you too, and we would have so much fun together. And I say, oh, I know, but those days will never happen again. There will never be another time as wonderful as when I grew up. I said, okay. And after she left, I thought to myself, uh, this lady is a little bit delusional. The next day, I talked to, I mean, this is the next day. I talked to another lady, and I said, well, again, she wanted to plan her funeral. And I said, well, tell me about your life. It was horrible. I grew up in the dirty 30s in the plains in a small town, a small farm. We, every day was a fight for survival. I'd have to get up and help with the chores. We'd walk five miles to school in horrible weather conditions. It was miserable. Now, having just talked to the other lady the day before, I thought, well, wasn't there anything that you enjoyed, like maybe a Christmas or something? And she said, no. <laughs> and after she left, I thought, oh, that lady is delusional too. Now, let's just look at that word delusional. Delusional means seeing the world not as it really is. If that's our definition, then we are all delusional, aren't we? Because we cannot see the entire world at one time because we're too small. Our ability to, to, to gather in that information, we just don't have a big enough mind. And not only that, the data that does come into our mind is like drinking out of a fire hose all day long. Our mind is busily not trying to remember things, but forget things. Vast amounts of data, unimportant stuff. We're trying to get rid of most of it so we can maintain our sanity. And the little bits left, those are our memories. And for reasons that are interesting to me, the first person's memories, the ones she selected, were quite different from the second person's, although their lives were fundamentally quite a bit the same. And the questions I asked myself after talking to those people, um, which one was happier? And which one would I like to be? Memories are particularly important to me. Uh, my mom has Alzheimer's. She's in the last stages of that. 
I talk to my dad once a week this very morning. These are his memories of talking to my mother when he visits her in the nursing home. It's terrible. I can't hardly stand to go. She was the smartest woman I knew, and now she cannot complete a sentence. She knows me some days. She doesn't remember you most days. Every day gets worse. I wish I didn't have to see her. By the way, everything he said is true. This is also what's true. When he comes in, she looks at her, and her face breaks open into a big smile. There's my Billy. There's my Billy boy. Oh, he is such a boy. And then they talk, and then she fades out. How interesting that that's my memory. That my mother is holding on to the most important memory, and that will be the last one that she has. And that is that she loves my father. I cannot control this terrible disease. But that memory, that's the one I want. That's the one I choose to keep. Now you think about this. Aren't we all, in essence, our memories? You are your memories. Everything that you remember Think about, that is you. I have heard psychologists talk about the ability to increase happiness. But after these situations and visiting with these people, I now recognize this as important as diet and exercise, and that is working on your memories. A couple of exercises that I do. I have a journal. Every day I write down three things I'm grateful for. Three things I'm grateful for that day. And here's the secret. You can't say the same thing over and over again. Uh, uh, family, health, or friends. Okay, cheating. Every day has to be something completely different. That gets to be hard to do. So eventually what you find yourself doing is in the course of your day searching for little things to be thankful about so you can remember them that night. So actively you are starting to remember the very best parts of your day. The other thing I do at night, I talk to my wife Libby. We say, what was the best thing that happened today? We go back and we think about the best thing that happened that, not the worst thing, because that's what we're most likely to say, oh, you should have seen traffic today. No. What was the best thing? And by recalling that and saying it out loud, we are in essence living it twice and increasing the odds that we will remember the very best parts. You see, I have a dream. And the dream is that when I am 85 years old, I will say with confidence that I lived a wonderful life. And when asked for proof, I will bring memories and detailed data that prove the life I led. And that is something that I am building every single day because I want to be the, the, the first lady, not the second lady. And you also have that choice. I want to talk about dreams now. This lady I'll call the double lung transplant lady. I got a call in March. Jeff, would you officiate at the funeral for so-and-so? I said, so-and-so? Wait a minute. 
I was at, I saw her in January at her husband's funeral. She looked great. She was full of life and vital. And they said, oh no, she was in terrible health. She was a double lung transplant, 14 years. It said, 14 years? Uh Uh-huh. That seems like a long time. As far as they know, that's a record. 14 years on a double lung transplant. Well, now, I needed to find out more. Two things. First off, whenever she went to the doctor, she went like she was dressing for an evening gala. Dressed to the nines with her best outfit, makeup, the whole, whole works. Why? Because she said, I am not going to be seen as a patient. I will be seen as a person, and they will know that. Something to remember. The second thing was, she had cultivated the habit of dreaming. She was a voracious reader. At her bedside, now think about this. We know that the worst time is after your spouse dies. Almost everybody goes through a severe depression. But her habit of dreaming was so overwhelming that she could not let that go. At her bedside, after she died, they found a pad of paper with two dreams on it. The first one, I will learn to cross stitch. There's a whole stack of two to-do books on how to cross-stitch. The second, I'm traveling to Cuba. She had heard that Cuba was open for tourism, and she was actively planning on going to Cuba. Boy, I thought I would tell my dad about that. You know, this, this power of, of dreaming. I said, Dad, do you have any dreams? I'm, I'm too old to dream. So this is uh, Dolores' story. That's the name I'll use. I talked to Dolores. I know her well enough that when I asked her how she was, she told me the truth. She said, I just came from the jail, the prison, where I visited my grandson. Um, When he was born, his parents wanted to put him up for adoption. So my husband and I decided that we would adopt him. We were 62. We did. Shortly afterwards, my husband died. And I became the sole parent at the age of 62 of this child. I loved him, but he had troubles. He had fetal alcohol syndrome and some other things that made him difficult to handle. He would have violent outbursts. At the age of nine, it was determined that it was too dangerous for him, for her to be his parent. But she did not give up on him. She poured herself into that boy. She advocated for him. She found him the very best care. And by the time he was a teenager, she had found a a couple who would raise kids in a foster family, but more of a family unit, and they specifically dealt with kids with this kind of issues and problems. And under their tutelage and love, this child finally at the age of 17 flourished into who he, she knew the person he could become. And then after that, the natural mother sued to get guardianship back, and she won in courts. And that boy was taken out of that and fell into a world of chaos and drug abuse. And he was sent to prison for assault. And in prison, he assaulted a guard and so was thrown into a maximum security situation. And she still did not give up on him. She visited him once a week, and it's just like in the movies, right? The 
shackles around the wrists that are attached to the waist and the, around the ankles as you shuffle into a closet and there's the plexiglass this thick and the holes through it and the phone. And just that morning, he had said, Grandma, don't come anymore. It's too hard. And that is the sorrow and suffering that this uh, Dolores was carrying. And I say that because all of us have some burden that pushes us down so that you can hear what she said next. But I need to tell you my good news. My birthday is next week. I'll be 85 years old, and I'm giving myself a birthday present. I'm joining a gym. I said, yeah. She says, I love to garden, and I need to get my strength up. And today, I'm meeting again with my pastor to go visiting. She explained. I approached my pastor, and I said, this... I know is a silly question, but do you ever need people like me just to visit with people? And he looked at her. He said, Dolores, my wife and I have been on our knees for 14 months every morning praying for someone like you. Yes. What would I do? Come with me. The first place they visited was a woman bedridden at home, catatonic. That means unresponsive to anything, just staring at a wall. She'd been that way for 12 years. Dolores said, I was a nurse. Things have changed. But some things haven't changed. I walked over to her in the bed, and I just put my hand on her cheek, and she went, oh. How long had it been since that woman had ever been touched by anyone? And her pastor said, now you know why I need you. And so she said, well, so I've got to go. And she walked out of that room with her burdens on wings of a dream for who she could be. I do that too. It's fun, actually. You should sit down and try it sometime. I encourage it. Every day, you should sit down with a piece of paper and you should dream. What do I want to do? What would it be like if I... And you go to that place, and in great detail, you describe it. What are you wearing? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are you thinking? You describe every aspect of that dream in great detail. And when you're done, you will have a, a smile on your face. You say, wouldn't that be nice? Here's what's funny. You should change that to... Won't that be nice? Because here's what's interesting. These dreams, they have a way of coming true. I want to live a life where after I'm gone, they describe the life I led and the things I did. And they'll shake their head and say, wow. That guy was living the dream. You know, um, it's funny. Just as an example. Long ago, or not, not that long ago, I got to thinking to myself, what would it be like to do a TED Talk?
Thank you. Thank you.